The Andromeda Strain is a Michael Crichton book published in 1969 during the final stages of The Race to the Moon. It is thus no surprise that the book ties into the events by imagining that when humanity goes to the stars, that it might bring something back. But not a B-movie terror, a genuine, realistic threat, given the unknown especially at that time. We begin with a couple of men, Lieutenant Sean and his technical assistant, Private Crane, attempting to locate the fall of a military satellite in the desert, and after six hours of searching using their van and some triangulation, determine that it's been found and brought to the sleepy town of Piedmont, population 48. These men and the satellite are part of Project Scoop, monitored back at Vandenberg Base by night ship supervisor Lieutenant Edgar Comro. Comro hears the tragedy unfolding as they arrive to find Piedmont dead, but shockingly, dead as if they had simply fallen over right in the middle of whatever they happened to be doing at the time. And things get worse, where, as the town is explored, a lone survivor is witnessed. Moments before, Sean and Crane both suffer instantaneous death. With the loss of their team, Major Manchek, the engineer in charge of Vandenberg at the moment, leaps into action and orders some aerial reconnaissance to see what they're dealing with. An interpretation of satellite imagery by their top analyst confirms the existence of one survivor in Piedmont, but everyone else, including their team, is dead. This is troubling because we learn Project Scoop is attempting to pick up microbes from outer space, suggesting that what happened in Piedmont is precisely that. Fortunately, Major Manchek had heard about exactly what was needed for this kind of situation, Project Wildfire, and places the call to activate the project and places Vandenberg on lockdown. Knowing he may suffer repercussions for exceeding his authority on that, but fearing it is necessary given the severity of the situation. Day one naturally sets the stage for the main thrust of the book, to unravel for us during the first four chapters the nature of the threat that is being dealt with, even though it is only a sample, and to show that this is a problem both caused by and being addressed by the U.S. military. But in actuality, very little is actually happening in those chapters, as you no doubt noted from the preceding summary. And yet, it's four chapters. It's because of Crichton's approach here, which is fascinated by detail. While some worry about getting into the weeds, Crichton seems to revel in the weeds. He goes on in detail why just one van with two guys in it are being used for the recovery, describes the actions involved in the scavenger, the reconnaissance plane, attempting to get recon footage for Vandenberg. There's a detailed discussion of what is seen in all of the imagery. This naturally gives us a detailed snapshot of what is being done with this work, to ground it in reality by emphasizing the procedural nature of things and establishing the reality that is the center of it. This is an extremely effective means of verisimilitude, vital in Crichton's goal of taking science fiction, an invading space germ, and telling you, this is reality, by putting it in terms that feel contemporary. We can easily picture the kind of things happening in any military operation, dealing with Soviet weapon tests, monitoring communist guerrillas, tracking nuclear material, to use a few contemporary examples. And by doing so, to take this routine and introduce the fantastical. Crichton's choice, then, is to frame the menace against this humdrum normalcy to make it real so that the subconscious unease is ramped up. It is for this reason that The Andromeda Strain is considered one of the first techno-thriller novels, something Tom Clancy would be famous for making a career out of 15 years later. Techno-thrillers have several common elements, but what is usually pointed to are the detailed technical aspects, presented far past the point that others would expect. And Clancy himself pointed to the Andromeda strain as what he felt was a fine example of that, even though their approaches and mindsets were different. Clancy is a patriot who lamented his unfitness for military service. Crichton is the medical doctor interested in extrapolation of real possibilities. The commonality to them isn't that they want to drown people in stats and procedures to show that they've done their homework, but to talk about the details because this endeavor is fascinating. The same reason one person might be able to know and revel in the stats of every Yankees ball player ever, or the details of every Beatles song and album ever produced, 
Crichton shows a fascination with the mundane aspects of these possibilities. In the later day two portion of the book, Crichton starts throwing all of those details at us. We learn about wildfire, a proposal that first comes about because of a lecture by a scientist named Merrick, who points out that with the biodiversity we see on Earth, the idea that first contact with another species like our own is highly unlikely. Putting at nearly a 98% probability that first contact will be with either unicellular or simple multicellular organisms. And given the percentage of such creatures on our own world that are harmful to us, there's a good chance any first contact will be devastating to us or the ecosystem. Thus the creation of Wildfire, an underground desert facility with five levels to it, made with each level more sterile than the one above it, to ensure maximum precautions, and a thermonuclear device just in case the worst happens and the site needs to be destroyed. The principal figure behind Wildfire, Jeremy Stone, is pleased with its approval, but admitted privately he was concerned that it had been too easy. The reason it was so easy is because of Project Scoop. Scoop's purpose is to do what Dr. Stone fears might happen on purpose. That is, to collect extraterrestrial pathogens and chemicals in the hopes of utilizing them as biological or chemical weapons. Crichton, again, spares no details. It's not enough that such a horrifying idea exists. He explores the background. Scoop is the brainchild of Major General Sparks, head of CBW Research, and despite one item after the next after the next to show the volume of items that are being generated on Earth by dedicated and top secret medical research, it's felt by the people writing the checks that the horrifying results that are being generated aren't enough. And so capturing bugs from space is considered as a way to further expand their efforts. Before the Piedmont incident, the best that they had managed was a disease that could make female chickens sick for a few days. So Piedmont is, unfortunately, exactly what they were hoping for, except that it's gotten out. Thus, wildfire is the check in place to keep Scoop from getting out of control. The one hand is playing with matches and gasoline, and the other hand is ready with the fire extinguisher. The system is just one example of what unfolds. The Andromeda strain, where every last detail is reflected on and considered and justified, and then we find that it is insufficient. Procedures are in place, and they are thoroughly weighed and balanced and explored, and then completely fail. Take, for example, the efforts of Sean and Crane to locate the satellite, two men with one van, and as a result, six hours passes between the time they are deployed and the time they locate the satellite in Piedmont. Had they used a large team operating in tandem, it's probable that the satellite never would have been brought to Piedmont, but the process is in place for logical reasons, so the process is followed, and the process causes disaster. It's Major Manchek who breaks from protocol and orders a base lockdown despite not having the authority, and thereby mitigating the potential for further escalation of the problem. While Clancy drew inspiration from Jules Verne, a 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea had originally contained a lot of content on political issues surrounding the Russian occupation of Poland, so it's not so far-fetched as that sounds. But Crichton was sometimes compared to Isaac Asimov instead bringing complex ideas to popular attention, to be sure. But also, as I've discussed in the robot novels, Asimov created the three laws, not to show the ironclad ways that they would make the world better, but to then work to show where the laws ran into obstacles. Likewise, Creighton creates these wonderfully detailed situations that seek to ensure everything is carefully considered and prepared for. Yet in Westworld, the robots run amok. In Jurassic Park, the dinosaurs won't be contained. The theme isn't that nature finds a way, or that we reap what we sow, but that no matter how carefully you plan, no matter how many studies and contingencies and think tanks and protocols are created, there is always going to be something that you miss. You'll dismiss the long odds. You'll not see the fatal flaw in your technology. You'll forget that fallible human beings are involved. 
Creighton offers us situations where a Batman-like level of preparation is in place to ensure a foolproof plan, yet Creighton's Joker will usually find a simple and obvious flaw that is easily exploited. As we continue covering the rest of the days, keep that in mind. Watch as Crichton builds reinforced concrete walls and then deliberately blows his trumpet to make Jericho collapse. See over and over his point about messing around with dangerous things. You will never be able to contain it because it is human nature to find some way of foolishly screwing it up. <laughs>